Psalm 38, verse 4. Short verse, but it makes the point, point for us today. For my iniquities have flooded over my head. Psalm 38, verse 4. The second part of that verse says, They are a burden too heavy for me to bear. When we have done something wrong and guilt settles in, we feel a heavy weight, that overwhelming burden bearing down on us. We feel bad about it, and we hope that nobody finds out what we did wrong. Uh, we feel ashamed of our failure and we wrestle with anxiety because we don't know what to do with it, how to fix it, uh, how to take care of it. And has that ever happened to you, that heavy burden of guilt? You don't have to raise your hand, but it has happened to me as I was thinking about the, the, the illustration. It's always a challenge to how much of a pastor's life do you share with your people? <laughs> and it's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> much younger days of mine uh, would uh, spend time fixing my cars more, much more than I do now. I prefer to give my car to the mechanic now, but, uh, so I'm not crawling under it, changing mufflers, taking off brakes, doing all those type things. Um, crawling in the dirt when I was younger was fine. Now that I'm almost 60, I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, so... <laughs> Don't fix my cars as much as I did, but at that time, uh, when you went to a, um, a U-Pullet junkyard, I'm, I, guys, you're familiar with the U-Pullet junkyard? I mean, you can get some pretty nice stuff there at a very reasonable price. And so one of the cars I was trying to fix up, uh, one of the trips we went to the, to the U-Pullet the place and was pulling off parts and things like that, and one of the things my car didn't have, um, it had the hole, but didn't have the cigarette lighter. You know, where you plug it in and then the, the elements start to heat up and it's like, that would be nice to have a, have a working cigarette lighter. Now, not because I smoked. I, I didn't need it because I smoked. Um, but I just thought, well, it, it's part of the car and I'm trying to make the car functional and have all the parts and pieces work and everything like that. So, it, you know, and you know, the cigarette lighter is just small. So I just stuck it in my pocket, kept working and pulling off and, and then went to the counter to pay and put up my parts and pieces and everything at a certain price and paid and left and went home and realized that that cigarette lighter didn't get put up on the counter. It wasn't paid for. It came home with me. And guess what happened when I tried to go to sleep that night? And that's when the guilt, the shame, the embarrassment hit like a ton of bricks. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. True story. So I'll stop the story there, catch you up a little bit later on. Um, but uh, it is that horrible, gnawing, nagging feeling. You knew it was wrong, but yet you still chose to do it. It was wrong. That was real guilt. And unless you're a perfect person, which of course none of us are, you have had to deal with real guilt too. But there's another kind of guilt that we need to be aware of, uh, that makes us feel almost as bad. Now, it's a kind of guilt that we would call a, a false guilt. Uh, false guilt comes from being caught up in someone else's circle of sin. Um, they have done something wrong, whether um, you know, it's your parents, your spouse, or maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your neighbor or coworker, uh, and it impacts you. You feel bad, even horrible because of it. Uh, and so you, you have maybe suffered mental, physical abuse, other things in your, uh, maybe your children and their lifestyle is, is just eating at your heart and just breaking you down. And it's like you're, you're just, every time you think about it, it just puts you in a tailspin over and over again, and you relive the hurt. So how do you know the difference between real and false guilt? How do you know if it's God speaking to you about the present or your pain speaking to you about your past. How do you distinguish between the two? And so we want to be able to help out a little bit. If you want to write down these thoughts, uh, some practical points uh, that might help in that area. And so if you want to try and determine, is this really something that I've done wrong and I'm responsible for? Or is this something that someone else has done to me and it continues to mess up my mind and my heart and my life? 
And the first thing is, is the focus on people or is it on God? So that's the first thing to write down. If you're trying to figure out false guilt, real guilt, real guilt, false guilt, what's going on? I just, I feel so bad and just got this weight in my life. And just, so the first thought then is, is the focus on people or is it on God? Uh, Dr. Paul Turnier says, uh, false guilt is that which comes as the results of judgments and suggestions of men. So it's that, that horizontal pressure and words that people are saying. Uh, true, true guilt is that one which comes as a result of divine judgment, what God thinks about the situation. So if you're struggling with false guilt, you're going to find yourself often trying to seek out the approval of people, and the, the ones that are around you. And if you're not careful, it can almost turn you into an approval junkie. Uh, you are trying to fit your life to please them, what they think, what they say, what, uh, and always trying to measure up to their standards uh, for your life. And one of the things that you come to find out if you're trying to please people is that it really wears you down. I mean, it's hard enough for me to live up to my own expectations, let alone live up to everyone else's expectations. And so if your focus is on people, you're probably dealing more in the area of false guilt than the guilt that comes from God. Because the second part of it, part number two, uh, the first is, foc is your focus on people or on God. The second part is, is it vague or is it specific? Is it just that kind of you kind of, kind of feel like maybe you kind of just have some claws in the back of your, your like maybe like uh, Frank Preddy's book, This Present Darkness. Did you ever read that? And they kind of the, the, the demons that were, had their claws into the people. Um, so you kind of feel like you have that. Or is it, I mean, it's like a, a, a flat, you know, searchlight has been turned on. It's a, you know, it's a spotlight. Boom! This is what you've done wrong. You put the cigarette lighter in your pocket and you didn't pay for it. Boom! Very specific. The deed that was done wrong. God is very good at turning on the searchlight and saying, that was wrong. What you said was wrong. Where you went was wrong. What you did was wrong. The person that you hurt, that was wrong. That's God. I kind of feel like nothing ever kind of goes my way. And it's like, man, man, man. That's not God. <laughs> that, that is, uh, God speaks very specifically. It's not that, that vague thing like, well, it never works out. I don't know what's kind of going on. I feel like I'm down in the dumps. And I guess I'll just go eat some worms. Um, so you, you want to be able to follow through. You know, folk, is the focus on people or is it on God? Helps you determine whether you have false or true guilt. Is it vague or is it specific? Again, trying to discern between those two, where those bad feelings and just kind of unsettledness, uh, where all that's coming from. And then thirdly, is it rules or relationships? Is it rules or relationships? Because in genuine guilt, real, real guilt, you acknowledge, I hurt someone. I failed to do the right thing in this situation. And in my situation, I failed to honor the company that I stole the cigarette lighter from. And I hurt that relationship. It was uh, one on, you know, you're on your honors. You were allowed to go out and pull whatever parts you wanted, but you also had to claim them. You had to, to, to go and pay for them and all of that. And so that's the, the difference then. Uh, when you have that uh, false guilt, uh, you know, it kind of um, blinds you to the miraculous work of God that is going to restore and, and make right the wrong. And, uh, but false guilt also then tends to bind you to the meticulous rules of men. It's like, well, you know, it's, well, technically it wasn't that, you know, it's like, oh, how much could that really have cost and all that? And they, you know, they're making lots of money. They didn't need me to pay my 50 cents or a dollar for that. So, and it's like, no, it's not rules. It's relationships to do what's right, honest, of integrity, all those type things. And so guilt, uh, what it is, it, it kind of works like a, a, a red warning light on your, your dash of your car. Now, it's not the yellow. It's the red. Yeah, you, you've seen both of them go off on your cars. I've had both go off on my cars, so down through the years. This is the red light, and it is nothing to, uh, to be trifled with, uh, such as um, you know, the oil. You lose it all out of your engine, and the red light goes on. 
you don't want to keep driving your car <laughs> when there's no oil in it. Uh, you have the antifreeze all drop out of your radiator and the red light goes on. Uh, you also have the uh, serpentine belt bus and the alternator is no longer generating juice and the red light goes on. Now, you can drive a you, you can drive a little bit longer when the alternator belt, you know, the serpentine belt, goes out because there's still a little bit of charge in the battery, so things keep working for a little bit. But when it happens at night and you've got your headlights on, you don't go very far. So, uh, you have to, <laughs> so the red light means you have to pay attention to it. Uh, all three of those things have happened to me down through the years, um, as well as also have had the brake lines break and dump all the fluid out, so you don't drive very far that way either. Also had a, um, a drive shaft drive out, drop out of a school bus I was driving in Binghamton, New York. You don't drive go very far when the, the drive shaft drops out, but no red light came on in those cases. But, so we're talking about the red lights. I mean, you, you gotta stop. You, you, you need, there's a big problem. And so uh, once that red light comes on and we start feeling bad, and it's like, oh, what's going on? Is this real and false? Am I responsible for it? Is someone else responsible for what's going on? So uh, there, there's many ways uh, that, that we have of dealing with guilt, and there's also some ways that God has with dealing with guilt. And guess which one works better? God's ways. Guess which one we're going to look at first? Our ways. So go to Genesis chapter 3, if you would, please. We might as well go back to the beginning, where all these problems start, and see our normal response. Our normal response as we go to Genesis chapter 3. And then verse 6. Genesis 3 verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at. And that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man, and said unto him, where out thou? Now, do you think God didn't know where they were? No, God already knew. He's just kind of giving them a chance to, to fess up here. Verse 10, and he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then God asked him, uh, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, the woman you gave to be with me she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. And so here we have the original sin, the original breaking of a right relationship uh, between God and his, his uh, creation. And the first there the aspect that we see is shame or embarrassment in this area of guilt. Uh, they felt bad at it. It's like, oh, we, we, we've just done something wrong and we need to kind of cover it up. And so they sowed those fig leaves. They you know, were trying to pretend like it didn't happen. We'll just cover it up and there's going to be no big deal. Uh, and uh, so that is one of the ways that we try to uh, deal with uh, wrongdoing on our part uh, is to cover up pretend. Lori had an interesting uh, event yesterday, uh, Friday with uh, Kennedy. And she was able to stay overnight. First time without her parents, without her siblings. She was just with grandma and grandpa. Uh, and we were having fun. And Lori goes down the hallway and says, Kennedy, who made a mess of, of, with the soap all over the, the countertop? And her response was, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> she was the only kid in the house, and uh, she is not going to uh, want to admit to that <laughs> particular thing. And uh, of course, we've, we've been able to, you know, raise our children and grandchildren, and so you kind of learn. It's like, oh, okay, you're not going to... Yeah, that made me think. It's like, I think it would be really hard for me to be a police officer or a detective. Because as you go to investigate things, how many times are they told a lie right up front? 
And that's why they think everybody's wrong. They, they kind of get jaded. It's like, okay, I know you're going to lie to me, but I got to ask anyhow. Uh, so I would, I would think being a police officer is going to be real. Is that me? Okay. Cam always gets nervous when I start walking around. <laughs> he never knows when I'm going to bump something. Thank you, brother. <laughs> And so we do. We always have that, uh, um, that desire to you know, just kind of cover it up, pretend it didn't happen, lie about it, whatever. Uh, so that is uh, something that is, we see there. But the, that shame and that embarrass, embarrassment, a lot of times we'll live with it and live with it and live with it and live with it for years. And does that shame and embarrassment and guilt ever make it any better? No. It never solves the problem. And so please don't get caught in that trap of just feeling guilty and having shame and being embarrassed about your past for years and years and years because you'll go to the grave that way. There is a way. There's God's way for dealing with those things so that you can be healthy and happy and productive and fruitful, all those good things. So shame doesn't uh, solve our guilt problem. After they were embarrassed and sowed the fig leaves, and they were, then they tried to hide themselves among the trees. And that's the next thing we do. Try and flee, try and run away, try and you know, not, not see it. But that doesn't work out either. Because um, you know, be sure your sin will find you out. You, you, you do get found out. You, you get uh, discovered in that, and so that doesn't work. And so the last area then is blame. Blame shifting. Uh, that uh, we try and point out someone else's wrongdoing, hoping that uh, they'll kind of forget what you did wrong and they'll kind of pass over. And that, that, and that one doesn't work either. <laughs> one person tried to say, well, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on, so the whole thing didn't work. Um, so if, if, if you got the joke, that's fine. You, you don't have to. But. So the, those are some ways of us handling guilt. Now, what we need to do is focus on God's way of handling guilt. And for that, you can go over to 1 John. So not, not John's gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John's epistle. So you have to go back to uh, 1 John right there uh, before the uh, book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 1. And verse 9. When you first get saved, this is one of the first verses that you're encouraged to memorize. Underline, highlight, mark, uh, understand. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first way that God wants us to handle our guilt when we've been wrong is to confess confess our sins. You say, you know, I did it. I confess that I'm sin. It, it's not on just our need. Well, I need this. No, it's, it's our sin. I did this wrong. It's not just our frustration. It's our sin. It's not just our problem. It's our sin. We agree with God that he is right. His ways, his truth, his word is right, and we're wrong. And so maybe we should practice that. Because as I date myself a little bit, remember Happy Days and the main character Fonzie, and he always had trouble saying the word r r r wrong. And we laugh at that because we can identify with it. We all have that nature that wants to hide and cover up and, and not bring into the light what we've done wrong. So we're going to practice it. God, you are right. I was wrong, right? God, you are right, I was wrong. On the count of three. Well, I'll say it together so you don't have to worry about your, your voice. On the count of three. One, two, three. God, you are right, I was wrong. And that is the basis, the foundation for confession, agreeing with God that what he has said is right and that we haven't lived up to it. And so that night with that cigarette lighter that was still in our apartment at the time, I had to do exactly that. God, you're right. I was wrong. 
Shouldn't have tried to justify it. Shouldn't have tried to excuse it. Shouldn't try to um, hide it. Shouldn't have tried all those things that are normal way of doing it. You're right. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I had to confess that to him. And that really is part of, and, and the reason why we get into trouble with God is that middle letter in the word sin. S I N. I want to do this. I think this is best. I think uh, this is the way it should go. I, th I think I can keep driving my car even though the red light is on. I did that once. It's two miles away from where I needed to be to get to work. Didn't want to be late. And the red light comes on and had lost the antifreeze out of the engine. I thought, Ah, oh, man, just a couple stop lights, a couple stop signs. I can get there. I can make it. Except it was a little four-cylinder horizon with an aluminum uh, head to it, and it was, mm, sorry. It was a very expensive repair. <laughs> the aluminum doesn't take the heat, uh, and it warped right away. Uh, so, yes, um, you, go ahead. You can try to ignore the red light when there's guilt going on in your life. It's not going to work. It's not going to be a pretty sight. It's going to cost a lot. Uh, so you have to be careful. You can either you know, try and cover up what the red light is trying to get your attention to deal with, or you can fess up. And it's much better to fess up, to confess that God is, is right uh, and uh, that we can't hide anything from God. Psalm 69.5 says, O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee. The only person we're fooling is ourselves when we think that God can't see or doesn't know what we've done. We need to agree with God that it's wrong, and then we need to make it right. And so that's what I had to do. I had to take that little cigarette lighter and give it back to the company. And so that's what I did. I drove back the next day, put the cigarette lighter back on the company's property. I no longer owed them any money for a cigarette lighter that I didn't have. So in that case, it was very easy to solve it, make it right. Now, I probably could have gone a little further and went to the manager and all those type things, and that, that may have been a little bit nicer to do. I'm a chicken. <laughs> and it's just like you don't want to be exposed and all those different type things. It was just a whole lot easier to throw it back over the fence and say, there, it's back where it belongs. Was I right or wrong? That'll be up to you. You can decide. But it was no longer, I didn't have a stolen property on my possession anymore. Uh, and it was back on the company property where it belonged. So that helped me to confess and then make right something I did wrong. And so I can talk to you about it and we can laugh about it. Um, but it also is a very important illustration that we must do things God's way if we want to have that clear conscience. One of the things that you, we need to pray for in our, you know, our daily life is that we would have clean hands you know, to serve the Lord, you know, a pure heart where there's nothing evil, wicked going on in our heart to serve the Lord, and a clear conscience where there's nothing that the Lord is shining his searchlight on saying, this is wrong, you need to take care of it, make it right, and do it now. As long as you don't have those things going on in your life, you have a wonderful life with the Lord, full of joy and peace and contentment always. And so just remember, the grace of God is the face of God as he looks on our failures and offers the help that we need to make it right. We have such a wonderful God. He's not up in heaven ready to give us a backhand because we were such a stupid idiot. Um, he's a God who loves us. He says, I'm here. I'll help you make it right if you'll confess. And then trust. That's the second thing that God wants us to do is to trust his character. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from a guilty conscience. Trust God will do what he has said in his word. Not this summer, but the summer before. Uh, we read a book by Beth Moore said, Believing God. Uh, and it was all pretty much around this idea of trusting God. And, and it boiled down to she had three, five main points out of that. That God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. I am who God says I am. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And his word is alive and active in me. And I can trust God to keep his promises. 
to do what he said in his word that he would do. And so if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins. We can trust the character of God to do exactly what the word of God says he will do. Any amens? We, we are need to trust him. And so this restoring grace is what the song that Mark and Cammie you sang for us today and come run home running. It's all about. It's trusting God's character to come back to him and to draw as close to him as possible and his grace will receive you. I don't know how, for how many of you that was a new song, uh, but it says, uh, Oh heart of mine, why, tr why must you stray from uh, the one so fair you run away and one more time you have to pay the heaviness of needless shame. In other words, the G word we're talking about today, guilt. That needless guilt that is weighing down, pressing you down, and it continues to encourage us to come uh, back home to him, uh, and where we even end up wrapped in a robe of righteousness, where we're as close to God as we possibly can with nothing sinful or shameful between us uh, and our wonderful Savior. So confess your sins, trust God's character, Thirdly, accept God's forgiveness. Simply accept it. He is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just some, all. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on me is not condemned. There's now, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. He's not holding anything over us anymore. If you had to go to the hospital and we do pray for people that have sicknesses and things because we really don't want you to have to go to the hospital. We'd really like God to keep you out of there. Now, now, doctors are nice people. We love them and nurses and everything. But if they don't have to do anything to you, I, th I think that's a really good thing. Um, but so when you go to the hospital and you had some surgery and you come back home um, and then the bill arrives, how many of you enjoy opening that big, big, big bill? Not too many. But you open it up and it says... Stamp paid in full. Okay, it says paid in full, but who did it? Is it really paid in full? Can I really trust that my bill's been paid in full and that it's not going to go to the, the collector and then they're going to be putting a lien against my property? But if that letter that came with the bill that said paid in full also had an additional attachment to it, that was from the board of directors of the hospital that said, we've reviewed your case and all of your charges, and we as an institution have uh, decided to pay that bill for you. And you know, this is my name, this is the date, and these are the minutes that it all took place and was included. Now, would that change your level of confidence in your bill being paid in full? Considerably. You wouldn't wonder who did it, why they did it, how they did it. It's like, it's all spelled out. You, you know who did it and when they did it and why they did it. And so when God says he's going to forgive all of our sins and we begin to wonder, does he really mean all? This is God's minutes from the, the boardroom in heaven. And he has signed it and said, paid in full. Our confidence is in him. We don't need to beat ourselves up and think, well, I did that, it's bad. It's like, no, God's forgiven us all of our sins. It's guaranteed by himself. There is no higher authority to guarantee. And so the Bible has been written to help us to know that Christ paid our debt in full. Amen? When God forgives, he forgives completely, thoroughly, fully, we don't need to walk around with a heavy load of guilt anymore. Some people are motivated to try harder uh, because they feel guilty. Other people are fearful uh, because, and they try to suppress things because they feel guilty. Don't let guilt control your life. Let grace empower your life to live in a new God-honoring way. And that's what the prodigal son did in Luke chapter 15. And we're not going to have time to go there today. But he confessed to his father. He trusted the character and goodness of his father. 
he accepted the full and free forgiveness of his father and he was what? Restored. Fully, freely restored. And that's what grace will do for you and for me every time. Restoring grace. How God works in our lives to his glory, his honor, and his praise. And so, don't leave here with a load of guilt. Deal with it God's way. Confess whatever you've done wrong. Trust God's character. He will help you make it right. And then accept his forgiveness. And go forth in that freedom, praising and thanking him with every breath that you take. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for an opportunity to look more closely, a little uh, deeper at your grace. May we get a better handle on how good and great and gracious you are so that we do not live under a heavy load of guilt and shame, whether it's real or false. But Lord, we'd use the spiritual tools that you've given to us to do what's right in your sight and see you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. Thank you that as we reveal these things to you, Lord, you supply the grace that we need to go forward and honor you. And Lord, we also thank you that we also have other brothers and sisters in Christ. If we confess our faults one to another and pray for one another, we can be healed. Lord, that, that revealing really is the beginning of healing. And so Lord, we, we pray that each and every person here at Grace Chapel has one, two, or three close friends that they can invite into their life and be open and honest about their life. Any struggles, uh, any past defeats, anything that is perhaps generating guilt in their life that together can go forward spiritually and get the victory over that and to give you the honor and the glory and the praise. So thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for showing us truth about yourself. And we pray that you would cause us to grow in the grace and knowledge of your son through it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to ask you to take out your Connect and Communicate card, please. Uh, make sure your name is on the front. Uh, if you're a guest, if you're visiting for the very first time, uh, please, on the front of that card, share as much as you are comfortable sharing with us. That'll give a, us a chance to get to know you a little bit better. And then turn it over on the back uh, as an opportunity for you to uh, share any prayer requests, anything that has gone um, maybe questions about the church, what do we, you know, how do we handle baptism, how do you become a member, uh, or I'd like to know more about being saved, uh, you can put any of those questions back there, and we'll contact you as long as you've given us contact information, we'll follow up on that and seek to be a blessing to you. And as you fill out your Connect and Communicate card, simply put it in the offering plate as that comes by in a little bit, and we have a, a coffee tumbler out there in the foyer. It's our gift, our way of saying thank you for being here and worshiping our great God together at Grace Chapel. So you fill those out, and uh, if you're already done, you can sing the first verse of Are You Washed in the Blood as Our Men Come Forward for Morning Offering of Gifts and Ties to the Lord. <laughs> for the cleansing bar. Oh. 